Lecture 49, the Lorentz transformations. So let's start by recalling what the Galilean transformations look like. So this is to describe relative motion uh, between two reference frames that are in uniform motion. So we would write that x prime, let me just draw a graph of what's happening here, right? So we've got t axis and the x axis. And then we're going to have some other moving reference frame, right? Which will, if we describe what its position is at some later time, so let's say at t equals zero, it's at zero, and then at some later time, it's at uh, some distance vt away, right? Move my point again. All right, so here we've traveled some distance vt, right? So to get the position, and this guy's got a ruler, right? Just you can imagine a little set of rulers and clocks traveling on this moving body. Let's say it's a train like we've been using in the past. If we have the value of x in the platform frame, then we can get the value of x prime in the moving frame by simply taking this number and subtracting off this distance, right? This is the distance vt, so we'd say, well, the position in the moving frame, x prime, is equal to x minus vt. Everyone remembers that? Mm -hmm. And we could work it out from the other way. We could say, well, what if we're in the moving frame? So we would then see the platform is moving in the opposite direction. And so you get an inverse Galilean transform, which I'll write in purple, which would say, would read x equals x prime plus vt prime. So why the plus? Well, because in this case, the velocity is the opposite direction, right? Yeah. If the guy on the platform sees the train moving to the right, then the guy on the train will see the platform moving to the left, right? Yeah. Okay. Now, though it's almost, you know, a waste to write it down, you could also say that t prime is equal to t, and t is equal to t prime. That's the inverse transform for time, okay? Okay. In the Galilean transformations, both times are the same, okay? okay. Now, in special relativity, as you recall, that's not the case. I'm going to derive an expression for the transformation equations that would be uh, valid uh, for special relativity, okay? okay? And the way we're going to do it is by assuming that in the limit of very small velocities, they must reduce to these, okay? That's a, what is the principle? I think it's called the correspondence principle. It's this idea if you have uh, uh, some laws of physics which are valid within, you know, some regime, and then you add to that by generalizing it in some way, it must reduce to the, the laws that we already know. For example, classical mechanics were the mechanics developed by Newton and people that followed him, and they correspond to kind of the everyday world, right? Whereas quantum mechanics is this new theory that developed in the 20th century uh, that pertains to very teeny tiny things, small things, subatomic particles and stuff like that. Um, and one of the requirements was that the quantum mechanics has to reduce to classical mechanics in the, in the limit of large scale, right? So if we scale everything up, instead of talking about electrons, we talk about, you know, beach balls, quantum mechanics should scale and, and look like classical mechanics. And I think they call it the correspondence principle. Um, so that's our goal. So one problem that we have is we can easily adapt something that will give us an equation that looks like the Galilean equations for the position. But the time, we know this is not going to work because the time is not the same in special relativity, as we've seen. So let's see how it is we come about getting this in the first place. So we know that when we draw our coordinate axes here, x and t, and then I'm going to put in our, that's awfully fast, our t prime axis, and then our x prime axis. So this line t prime, right, what does it mean? It means... What, are, what is it in terms of x and t? We, we figured that out last time. This just says that x is equal to v times t, right? If I use x equals v times t, I can figure out where the, uh, the origin of the moving frame is at any point in time. That's almost identical to what we just did before, right? And so from this falls the idea, right, that x, say, x prime equals 0. Do I want to use x prime? Yeah, I guess I do. I can subtract from this, I'm going to subtract the quantity x equals vt, okay? 
So I'll distribute the minus signs throughout here. That'll become minus x and minus vt, right? And then just gonna mess up prime this. Add those together it gives me x prime minus x equals zero minus vt. So minus vt. So I solve for x prime. So I get x prime equals x minus vt. That's this equation here. You see? So why did I do that? We already knew that, right? That's it. This we already knew. Well, I did that so that I can model how I'm going to get an equation similar to this for time. So let's look at the x prime axis from special relativity. And we learned last time uh, using a, a, a geometrical proof, but you can do it. You did it in a homework assignment with the algebraic proof um, that this axis, the x prime axis, is given by the equation t equals v times x. Right? This this very symmetrical set of equations here. This is where c is equal to 1, okay? but we're going to keep c equals to 1 for a bit. So what I can do here is I can say, well, all right, let's now consider t prime equals 0, and we'll subtract from that t equals vx, t equals vx. Because what we're doing is we're solving these equations simultaneously. These are the same lines, and therefore they should be equal to each other, okay? Let me make that equals a little nicer. Equals. Let me distribute the minus sign. This just becomes minus t equals minus vx. Add those together, I get t prime minus t equals 0 minus vx, so minus vx. Um, now I'll solve for t prime, I get t prime equals t minus vx. It looks very symmetrical to what we had before. Okay? Okay. So this is going to be the model that we use to develop these Lorentz transformations. Okay? Yeah. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, you can see that this t prime, in the event that v becomes 0, right, or very, very small, the, the uniform velocity between the frames, that t prime is going to be equal to t, in agreement with this. Yes? Yes. Because v times x, well, if v is 0, that last term just disappears and we get t prime equals t, which is what we get with the Galilean transformations. But we don't have anything in, in this equation here right, that's going to help us, right, if v is equal to 0, x prime equals x, well, that's true here too, but it, it's, it's no different. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to introduce this. We're going to say x prime is equal to gamma times x minus vt, and there will be, of course, an inverse equation for that, which is x equals gamma times x prime minus vt prime. And t prime equals gamma times t minus vx. And then the inverse transformation equation, t equals gamma times t plus, of t prime plus vx prime. Okay? Now, again, let me explain the justification in writing that down. We know that in the limit of small velocity, the transformation equations we come up with should look like these. You have a question? I need to show up in my pencil. Okay, we'll take a little pause. Here, I can. This side? Yeah, black tip. Easier to see. Okay, pencil sharpening break. <laughs> Alright, where was I? So, I wrote it down like this. It looks like I'm just jumping to the answer. Okay, and it turns out this will be the answer. Okay, but we don't know what the gamma is yet, but let me explain it to you. So I'm going to imagine I've got this parameter gamma, which is dependent on velocity only. Okay? I didn't write it as a function of velocity because it just makes it a little messy looking. So I'm just leaving it without the functional brackets around it, right? But it's a function of velocity. And when the velocity is low or zero, it's going to basically be one. That's my requirement. Something that tunes down to about one when we're at very low velocity. So it turns off these relativistic effects and we get back to good old Galilean relativity. Okay? okay. Um, and I use the, these time transformation equations, which I got in the same way that we got the original equations, right? This is using this, this, it's derived from the fact that the, I'm not sure how to say it, the fact that the x prime axis is at an angle, right, with respect to the x axis. Okay? Okay. That's where it comes from. So it, it has to do with the fact that lines of simultaneity, as we found uh, in the platform frame, are horizontal lines, whereas lines of simultaneity in the moving frame are diagonal lines of some kind. Okay? okay. So that's why I wrote it this way. 
Um, there are a variety of ways to derive the, these are called the Lorentz transformations, I'll explain why at the end, uh, but I think this is the easiest way. We just imagine a set of transformation equations which will reduce to the Galilean transformations as they should when the velocity is small. Now the only issue left for us to resolve is what gamma is. Let me point out that I, I made gamma the same in all four of these, and you should expect that they're probably the same in x prime and x, uh, and, but maybe you think, well, the, why would they be the same in t prime and t? And let me just say that without going into details, that it can be shown that they should be the same. And it's not that hard to do, okay? I just don't want to complicate things any more than I need to. So now the question, what do we do with this? Well, if we want to figure out what gamma is, right, it should be the case that if I take x from here, from the inverse transformation, and t from the inverse transformation of time, I should, get the, I should get back x prime and t prime. So if I plug in x and t in here, I should get x prime equals x. That's my requirement. Has to be that way, right? When I take a transform and I put its inverse transformation in, that's why we call it an inverse. It kind of undoes what the other did. So that's essentially what we're going to do. We just plug it in. See, it's not that hard. So we say x prime will be equal to gamma. I'm going to put some big brackets around it because gamma is multiplying everything that I'm about to write down. But instead of writing x down, well, maybe I'll, let me start like this. That way you can see the correspondence. I'll write the equation that I'm going to work with. Gamma x minus bt. Okay? And I'm going to rewrite this. x prime equals gamma. I'm going to put some big brackets around it. And instead of x, I'm going to substitute this inverse transformation equation, x equals gamma x prime minus bt. So that's gamma x prime minus b t prime. Okay? Just plug in for x using the inverse transformation equation. Minus v times t. And instead of writing t, I'm going to plug in the inverse time transformation equation, t. That's v times gamma times t prime plus v x prime. There we go. Now we see we've got a gamma here and a gamma here. Right? Yeah. Factor those out. So I'll get x prime equals gamma squared, and I think I can be safe just using parentheses now, times x prime minus v t prime minus v times t prime. You see that? I already factored out the gamma. So I'm just left with minus v t prime. And then minus v times plus v x prime will be uh, minus v squared x prime. I think I'm good, yeah? Yeah. These? Hang on a second. Oh, I, I see my mistake. When I substitute in for x, nah, why don't you guys let me make this dumb mistake? This should be plus. Remember the velocity is in the opposite direction, so the sine flips, right? Yes. The inverse transformations are plus vt prime or plus vx prime. So I have a sign error here. It just came out. So that would have meant this guy would be minus making this guy minus, and now it does what I expected it to do at this point, which is to have plus vt prime minus vt prime. This just cancels out. You see that? Yes. All that goes to zero. Uh, okay. Yes. Okay, and all I'm left with is x prime minus v squared x prime. But I can factor out an x prime out of that, right? So I'm going to write this as x prime equals gamma squared x prime times 1 minus v squared. Okay? Okay. Going pretty well so far, right? Hold on, Does anyone see what I'm going to do next? No. Well, I've got an x prime on the left and an x prime on the right, right? No. Just divide those out. This gives me that 1 equals gamma squared times 1 minus v squared. Hmm? Yeah. Now I'm going to solve for gamma. So I'm going to divide by 1 minus v squared on both sides. I'm going to flip which side gamma's on. So we get gamma squared equals 1 over 1 minus v squared. And finally, I'm going to take a square root. Gamma equals the square root of, well, actually, I'm going to write it like this. Square root of 1 is 1, right? So gamma equals 1 over the square root of 1 minus v squared. Now, there is an issue about whether I keep the positive or the negative root, okay? And let's see. Well, let's look at this equation here, and let's let t equal 0, right? So that would say that x prime equals gamma x minus 0. So just x prime equals gamma x, right? Right. And let's say that the velocity be 0, okay? 
<coughs> so the velocity is zero and the time is zero. We should get that x prime equals x because they're going to be right on top of each other, lined up, right? Yeah. So it wouldn't make sense to have gamma be negative, right? So if the velocity is zero, then the value of this is either plus or minus one. It should be plus one. That way x prime is equal to x. So we'll just use the positive root and we'll call it this. And so that's the last little piece we put into our equation over here. We just add this a little bit. Gamma is equal to 1 over the square root of 1 minus v squared. Okay, so let me erase this and just make a couple of comments on what we've got here. Um, so I took, I let c be equal to 1. What would happen if I put c back in? I wanted to fix all that. Well, the equations that it's going to change. You see that the equation for x prime and x, right, when you take, it's saying gamma is unitless, okay? Well, actually, we've got to show that gamma can be unitless. So what do we do to see that gamma is unitless? We have to put c in here, and so we get 1 over 1 minus v squared. Well, the units of 1 are unitless, right? The units of v squared are the square, it's meters squared per second squared, okay? So the way we fix that is we divide this by c squared, okay? Okay. Now we have a velocity squared, units of velocity squared divided by units of velocity squared. It's unitless again, okay? So when you're going to put c in and use an actual value for c, you divide v squared by c squared. Um, x prime, right? Everything, it works out there. So we have a unitless quantity, right? Uh, times uh, something that measures meters minus something that measures uh, velocity times time. But velocity times time, I guess I should write like d for distance. And velocity times time is a distance, so the units there are fine. Don't have to make any changes to that. Where we do have to make some changes are the, the t prime and t equations. So to put in c, not being equal to 1, right? Again, gamma is unitless, so that doesn't matter, but we have a time minus, well, that, so it's in units of time, minus velocity times distance, right? So that's meters per second. Let's just do it like this. <laughs> Seconds, I think people put brackets around them to say that these are units. I think I've seen that before. And so here we have velocity, which is meters per second times time, or excuse me, uh, times meters, which has units of meters. So that's going to give me units of meters squared per second, and it needs to be in units of seconds. Okay. Now you can play around and try to figure out what what you should do in this case. Um, I think if I divide by c squared, that fixes it because you know. So let's say get that out of the way. We're going to say that t prime is going to be equal to gamma t minus vx over c squared. So now I've got meters squared per second uh, time, uh, divided by uh, meters squared per second squared, which is the same thing as multiplying times second squared per meter squared. The meter squared cancels, and I'm left with seconds minus seconds, so I have it set. So if you want to put c back in, you have to divide this term and this term by c squared. And you have to divide this velocity by c, velocity squared by c squared under the square root sign. And you're set. That's how you get the units back in if you need to put them in. Um, so now you can verify, it's easy to do, right, that as gamma approaches, so what, is, what do speeds look like if I don't have the units in here? Well, if I'm traveling the speed of light, my velocity is 1. If I'm traveling less than the speed of light, then my velocity is less than 1. Okay, so we could maybe go with, uh, what would it look like for gamma being 80% the speed of light? Well, we have gamma equals 1 over the square root of 1 minus... 0 0.8 squared, uh, which is same thing as uh, 1 minus, uh, it's going to be 0 0.64, right? It's 0.8 squared. And what is 1, point, what is one minus 0.64? I believe it is 0 0.36, right? Yes. And you can kind of see that this is really... Uh, 1 over 0 0.6, right? Am I doing this right? Hope I'm not messing this up. 36, that gives me 1. Subtracting so this, square root of this would be, so 0.6 times 0.6 is 0.36. Yeah, I think that's right. And this is the same thing as 1 over 6 over 10, right? Which is 10 over 6, which we can reduce as 5 over 3. So for 80% of the speed of light, gamma equals 5 thirds is a handy thing to keep around. Okay, so what is V, right? So here, V, I said, was 80% uh, the speed of light. That's 8 
over 10, right? Which is the same thing as uh, 4 over 5. So V equals 4 over 5 and gamma equals 5 over 3. This is 80% the speed of light. Those are handy numbers to use because they're easy fractions that you can work with. Okay? But yes, that's right. That's right. So if you have to do any actual problem solving in relativity, right, uh, and you need to pick some speed that's going to have some relativistic, relativistic effects, 80% of the speed of light is, is handy because you get these easy fractions to work with. It makes the math a lot easier. Um, what was I going to say about that, though? I forgot what I was, what I was talking about. Was I showing that uh, this reduces to this and the limit that the velocity is zero or small? I don't know. I don't think so. Well, okay, I'm not sure. So where did it all come from? Why, why is it named after Lorentz? I'll tell you. So at the end of the 19th century, 19th, yeah, beginning of the 20th, yeah, not, at the end of the 19th century, uh, a couple of American physicists by the name of Michelson and Morley had done an experiment to test this theory about the ether, this mysterious substance they thought light was propagating through. Like, you know, what's the medium that light propagates through? And they said, well, it's the ether. It's this kind of absolute quantity. And so we're moving, so we're moving through the ether here on Earth, which means that we could build a very complex experiment to measure the speed of light in two different directions, right? Say, you know, the north-south direction and the east-west direction. And because we're moving in the east-west direction, right, we should see a difference in the speed, right? Because we're moving in that, we're moving through the ether in that direction. Um, it's kind of like being in the motorboat and, you know, speeding past somebody's wake. Um, and so they did this experiment and they found that there was no difference in the speed of light in either direction, okay? And I think it was Joule, I think it was Joule, or no, it was not Joule, Lord Kelvin, I think. Lord Kelvin uh, had postulated a theory that somehow space contracted in the direction of motion. Uh, and this accounted for the fact that the speed of light was constant in both directions. And so they're, so they're saying the ether is real and that this is an effect of contraction in the direction of motion of velocity. Uh, and nobody paid any attention to it, I don't think, until uh, Lorentz uh, came along soon after and said, you know, I've done some calculations and I think this theory is valid. I think there is a contraction in the direction of motion. He derived these equations, which will show that there's contraction. Um, and his explanation for it was, at the time, the electron was a brand new particle. They just discovered it. So they said, well, we have the ultimate constituents of matter, right, the electrons. And so they said, well, you know, why not have it that, you know, he postulated a theory that perhaps electrons are a thing that contract in the direction of motion. So if you have some matter and the electrons are in it, and if you move the matter in this direction, that they'll contract in that direction of motion as some property of electrons. Because they didn't know as much about electrons at that time. And so that was the original proposition. Uh, that's why we put his name on the transformation equations. Uh, but it's Einstein that really gets all the credit for all of this stuff because he's the one that really put all of this stuff into a coherent and cogent framework uh, that made sense. Other players uh, at the time, um, uh, the Frenchman, I, I always mess his name up, and now I can't even think of his name. Poor guy. Um, I want to say Dirichlet, but that's a mathematician, a completely different thing. Um, sounds like Dirichlet, though. I can't, I can't think of his name. There was another physicist, French math, a French physicist, mathematician, that was also working on relativity and had very similar ideas to Einstein, but Einstein really summed it up best. He had the most coherent and inclusive uh, you know, framework of all of them. He really explained it in a masterful way. Um, yeah, so that's the Lorentz transformations, and that's it.